Good morning. And I'd like to welcome you on this glorious fall day to worship at the First United Church of East Syracuse. Whether you're here in the sanctuary or you are viewing the service on one of our social media platforms. As is our custom, I'm going to light two candles this morning. The candle of remembrance is lit for those in the military, for their families, our veterans, first responders, and all those in harm's way. The candle of peace is lit to remind us to pray for God's peace, peace in our homes, our community, our nation, and in the world. Before we go any further, I'd like to welcome Reverend Beth Quick back to our pulpit this morning, and also welcome Jane Lorraine back to our music department this morning. It's glad to, we're glad to have both of those folks with us. Um, Parish Council will meet on Tuesday night at 6.30. Are there any other announcements? It'll get warmer. <laughs> it should get a little warmer in here, yes. Our heating system has been turned on for about 40 minutes now, so hopefully it will start to warm up. And we're going to move around a little bit. Please, please dance while you sing. <laughs> dance while you sing, yes. <laughs> so uh, it didn't get turned on until this morning instead of yesterday. No other announcements? Okay, if you will rise as you are able and join me in our call to worship. Whether we live in an apartment or a house, if we reside in the suburbs or the city, God tells us to pray for the places where we live. Whether we are exiles or prisoners for the gospel, if we are young, old, insider, outcast, God says, when you search for me, you will find me. Whether we have been wandering and lost, or if we have lived in the same place all our lives, God says, I will gather you from all your places and bring you home. Our first hymn this morning is number 427, where across the crowded ways of life, verses 1, 2, 4, and 6.
seated. Now join me in our litany of confession and assurance as printed in the bulletin or on the screen. But thus says the Lord, seek shalom wherever you are, for your shalom shall be found in the shalom of the community. We find ourselves in exile caused by relationships, economics, and failing health. But thus says the Lord, seek shalom wherever you are, for your shalom shall be found in the shalom of the community. We feel used by people and systems, sometimes even abused. But thus says the Lord, seek shalom wherever you are, for your shalom shall be found in the shalom of the community. We thirst for God's promised justice through swift vengeance. But thus says the Lord, seek shalom wherever you are, for your shalom shall be found in the shalom of the community. We strive to protect our families and our interests from any wrath. But thus says the Lord, seek shalom wherever you are, for your shalom shall be found in the shalom of the community. We long for the day when passive peace will prevail. But thus says the Lord, seek shalom wherever you are, for your shalom shall be found in the shalom of the community. May our actions embody our prayers for the healing of the community, and therein may we find our long-awaited wholeness. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from Jeremiah, chapter 29, verses 1 through 14. These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother, the court officials, the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the artisans and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Eliza, the son of Shapham, and Jeremiah, the son of Hilakiah, whom, whom King Zedekiah of, Ju of Judah sent to Babylon to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, 
Do not let the prophets and the diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, says the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. The word of God for the people of God. Our next hymn is number 432, Yezu, Yezu. seated. Well, good morning again, friends. It's, it's so good to be with you here again today and to be in this, uh, in this time of worship together. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh, God, our rock, our strength, our love, our joy, our hope, our Redeemer. Amen.
My question for us today is, should Christians be involved in politics? Should Christians be involved in politics? Uh, when we think about politics, there are a lot of negative scenarios that might in immediately pop into our mind, right? Uh, think of our current context. Um, accusations of voter fraud and stolen elections, Supreme Court decisions that uh, divide ongoing Justice Department investigations, worries about uh, a peaceable transfer of power, trials happening related to the events of January 6th, family members of current and past presidents under scrutiny, and all of that in addition to what seems like just a relentless election cycle and negative campaigns and name calling and corruption. And perhaps our very immediate gut response to a question like, should Christians be involved in politics is, let us, let the church, let Christians run as far in the opposite direction of whatever we might think of as politics as possible, right? Of course, we shouldn't get mixed up in politics. I mean, not every politician can be uh, our once mayor, Carl Sterling, right? So let us run from politics. But what exactly are politics? What do we mean by that word? I mean, it has a lot of connotations today, but the origin of the word is more simple and straightforward. It comes from the Greek root word polis, which means city. And so politics simply meant the affairs of the city. And so in other words, politics meant, it is meant to mean things that are related to the concerns of the places where people live. Our scripture passage for today comes from a time when the Israelites were living in exile in Babylon. We heard that in the text that Joan read. Bless her for all of those names that were included in that text that she did a great job with. Uh, so Israel had gone through a long period of being conquered by foreign nations and being occupied by foreign rule. And eventually, they were even sent out of their homeland to live in other places. Now, not every resident of Jerusalem was sent to live in exile, but all of the leaders of the community, the royal family and many of the priests and prophets and even the artisans and the smiths, all of the people essentially who were responsible for running things, they were all exiled to Babylon. And Jeremiah, a prophet, he's not in Israel either as he writes. He's living and writing from Egypt. And so he too was far from home and has deep insight into what the people are going through. And so Jeremiah writes a letter to these leaders who are exiled in Babylon. And he says that God has a message for them. And the message is, Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Get married and have children. Watch your children get married and have children. Continue to grow your family, your people. Multiply here, don't decrease. But seek the welfare of the city, the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to God on its behalf, because in the welfare of the city where you are in exile, you will find your welfare. And I can only imagine 
that the people found Jeremiah's words shocking. Seek the welfare of Babylon? Seek the welfare of the nation that has essentially captured them and imprisoned them far from home? But but Jeremiah urges the people to live, to really live, to really thrive even in Babylon and to care for what happens even to Babylon. Seek the welfare of the city. In the Hebrew text, the word that we read there as welfare is the word shalom. You might have noticed that we heard that word a lot in our litany uh, of confession, shalom. If this word is familiar to you, you might know it often translated as peace. But unfortunately, sometimes we we use the word peace as kind of a, a throwaway word. Sometimes it loses its power. Doug Priest writes, The meaning of shalom goes farther. It means wholeness and health. Shalom refers to the internal peace we have in our soul, spirit, and body. But shalom is even more than that. It it applies to our relationships at work and our relationship with nature and creation. To have shalom is to be whole and healthy in yourself and all that challenges you, be it people, be it the issues of your world, your environment, your society, or be it the problems which are at hand, the problems which await you. God tells the Israelites that after 70 years, Israel will be able to turn home. And of course, many, many of the people Jeremiah is writing to won't even live to see that day. But their children and their grandchildren will. And so God urges them to think about the future, about the world where they want their descendants to live, the world where their descendants might thrive. God says, surely I know the plans I have for you, plans for your welfare, your shalom, and not for your harm, to give you a future with hope. When the people call on God and pray to God, God will hear. And when they search for God, they will find God. If they seek with their whole hearts, I will let you find me, God says. And I will gather you back together and restore you and bring you back home. If they seek the shalom of the city, even in Babylon, they will find God. They will find future and hope as God promises. In the, in the broadest, purest sense, I think that to be political is to be deeply concerned with the affairs of the places where people live. And I find in Jeremiah's writing, in God's words that Jeremiah shares, I find a call to us to be deeply invested in working for the welfare, the shalom, the wholeness and health and thriving of the places where we live. God calls us to be invested in building up not just our own lives, but the whole community, building for the generations to come. God promises a future with hope when we make sure that it is God's vision of shalom that we are pursuing. And I think pursuing God's future for the world is political 
we are choosing and advocating for God's principles to be the ones that guide and shape our world over many sets of alternative principles that are available. And so our role as people of faith is to work on God's behalf for true shalom, seeking the welfare of the polis, the city, the place where we live. So how do we do that work? How do we seek after the welfare of the city? And I think, of course, that our, that our best bet in answering this question is to turn right back to the scripture, to our text from Jeremiah. Listen again to God's words to the exile in Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry, let your children marry. Have children, multiply. Seek the welfare where I have sent you into exile. Pray on its behalf for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Now, of course, our contexts aren't entirely the same. We haven't been conquered by a foreign nation. We aren't living in exile. But I think that there are guiding words for us here. I think we develop the shalom that God calls us to by investing in our communities. And we do that by imagining that we will be in our community, in in our place for some time. Now, the Israelites, they didn't want to imagine that they were gonna be in Babylon for long enough for it to matter to them what happened there. But their exile, was 70 years. And if they just kept waiting to get out of Babylon, they would have wasted their whole lives, their children's whole lives. And so instead, they had to invest where they were, start seeing where they were as their home, their community. Some of you may have lived in East Syracuse or nearby for your whole life. Some of you might be newer to this place. But regardless of how long we are in a place, we can open our hearts to that place. Or we can let ourselves never connect, imagining that we are passing through and on to something better. So how will we invest where we are? We can build relationships across boundaries. God tells the people to marry and to have families. That might sound like no big deal, that part of the text. But not every Israelite would be marrying another Israelite some of them would inevitably be marrying Babylonians. And intermarrying between nations was crossing major boundaries. So what walls between us and them are in your community? Who is across the tracks? What groups of people live in your neighborhood and what groups don't? The way of Jesus, God's way of shalom, is a boundary-crossing way. So how can we build relationships like God does? We grow where we're planted. We produce life. God tells the Israelites to plant gardens and to eat from what they produce. And cultivating the land takes time. It takes 
connection with a place and pride in that place, and it signifies care and commitment. And God asks the Israelites to do this on enemy soil. So where are you growing the good food of peace and shalom? What fruit of faith and love is your life producing? And we do all of this, God says, because the welfare of the other, the welfare of the foreign land, the welfare of the enemy of the other place, the welfare, their welfare, is our welfare. Their peace is our peace. And so whenever the welfare of our communities is lacking, when there is no peace for people among whom we live, there can be no real peace for us either, no shalom. So what does it mean in your community in this community, in the community of the First United Church of East Syracuse, what does it mean to seek the welfare of the city? As an individual, as a family, as a congregation. That's the work that God calls us to. It's politics. <laughs> Maybe not the kind that we're used to, but God calls us to seek the welfare, the shalom, the wholeness of the places where we live. Whether where we are is just where we want to be, or whether where we are is far from what we'd call home. Either way, God's people are meant to seek and to cultivate shalom, a deep peace that comes from reconciliation and right relationship with God and one another. And as I said, maybe that's not what we think of when we think of politics today. I can't think of anything that more embodies being concerned with the affairs of the city than working together for true shalom. So should Christians be political? Well, if not Christians, if not people of faith, then who is it that we want to take up this work that God sets before us. So let's seek after the welfare, the shalom of our world and our nation and our community right here. Because God has plans for us, a future with hope. And when we seek God with all our hearts, I believe we will find the shalom we seek. Amen. If you are Worshiping here in person, you may place your offering envelopes in the basket in the narthex. Or if you are at home, you can mail them to the church at 823 Franklin Park Drive. And Jane will lead us in our doxology, our song of thanksgiving. You will rise, please.
let us join together in our prayer of dedication. Merciful God, your steadfast love endures forever. We are grateful that when we are hungry in body or spirit, you give us food. Help our congregation to bring nourishment to those who are hungry for your good gifts. Use these tithes and offerings to reach people with your loving kindness. We pray through Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, as we prepare for a time of prayer, are there uh, some joys or concerns or other prayer requests that you would like to share? I think Anne will bring the, the microphone to you if you have something to share. Dawn. <laughs> First, I would like to share the concern that the vendor did not get here last week to fix the issue with the uh, boiler. Um, I don't want to make a promise, but hopefully they will be here this week, and that would be the joy. Also, I, I want to let you know that um, Charlie Combs uh, is it up, not at, ups, at Krause Hospital with pneumonia. He's been there a couple days, mm -hmm. and uh, Chip will keep me updated on uh, his condition. Did you say uh, upstate? Uh, no, no, I did, but that, that was not right. Okay. I said Kraus. Kraus. <laughs> We're Sorry. making a good team here, Anne. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does anyone else have any joys or concerns? Uh, Dawn. Who? Dawn. 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 <laughs> Dawn hopefully has found her family in Florida. Uh, yes, um, this is in Cape Coral, Florida. My sister was in a nursing home, and thank goodness that she was well cared for. As for my nieces and nephews, they all have been located. They are doing okay, but all of them lost all their material things. Thanks for any prayers. Anyone else? Oh, I saw another hand over here. <coughs> all right, good morning. Um, just so you folks know that uh, Unfortunately, I was under the weather last week. I wasn't sick. We had a little story, though, that was kind of interesting. I thought I would tell you, and then I also have one other thing. So last Sunday, uh, I actually, I'm sorry, during the week Wednesday, I was very sick. So um, I told my neighbor, you know, don't call the fire department. I'm gonna, I'm still alive. So come Sunday, I, I had supposed to, she's very good at checking up on me. I was supposed to have gone out Saturday evening uh, to visit a friend, but I didn't go because I didn't feel good, right? So um, <laughs> Sunday morning, she sees that I hadn't gone to church and that I always go to church. So she called the fire department. But she, uh, and uh, my two neighbors have keys just in case. So she says to the firefighter, uh, would you take the key? I can't go in there. And uh, the guy said, well, don't you want to see if he's all right? And she says, no, I'm going to leave that to you. <laughs> so they came in. I told them I wasn't uh, up to par. They said, OK, if you need anything, call. And I said, I would. So. Yeah, I just thought that was interesting. She's a very nice lady. Uh, she does look out for me since March mm -hmm. one. So uh, today is uh, the Fallen Firefighters Memorial. That's why I'm dressed. Normally I would be in Maryland today in Emmonsburg for the Fallen Fire. So sometime today when you have a chance, say a little prayer. Uh, we lost 50 firefighters in the state of New York this year, so obviously that is not good, but um, this uh, memorial helps. Uh, believe me, uh, if you could be there to see it, there's what they call a sea of blue on both sides of the sidewalk as the families walk up and go to their destination uh, before the service starts. Uh, it's amazing. Um, um, that's all I can say, and um, so that's why I'm in my uniform today, and I thank you all very much. Thanks, Chuck. 
Um, Chuck, I have pictures, pictures to show anyone who's interested, as I was there a couple weeks ago uh, for the dedication for the brick for Phil Palatano. And um, yes, there's, it's, it's, uh, it's very impressive, all of the way that has been laid out. And I do have pictures to show you, and anybody else who'd like to see them later on? Okay. Anyone else? Okay, I believe choir is starting mm -hmm. next week, correct, Joan? Isn't choir going to start next week? Uh, yes. Yes, choir starts next week, and we thank Jane and Lorraine for being here with us this week. A while ago, I had told you about my niece who's um, 45 and expecting her first baby, and she's having some blood pressure issues, so if we could just keep her in our prayer, she needs to get through just a couple more weeks before they feel that she, everything would be fine. So just keep her in your prayers. Cause What's her name, Diane? Stephanie. Stephanie. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. I would just like to welcome any visitors that are here this morning um, and remind you that there are um, refreshments downstairs after the service. Thanks, Anne. Friends, let's join our hearts together in a time of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this time to be together today. We give you thanks for this community of faith, for the opportunity we have to be together with one another, to lift our voices in song, to hear your word spoken, to study your scripture together and seek understanding, to consider uh, the affairs of this community, uh, this congregation, but the, also the community in which we are placed, this community and this nation and this world, as, as you call us, God, to seek its welfare as we seek our own welfare, as we seek you. Oh God, as we gather today, we bring before you the joys and the concerns that are on our hearts, and we lift them up to you knowing that you hear and listen and respond in love. Uh, we lift up uh, the, the concerns of the the physical space here on a day when we're uh, maybe a little chilly and challenged by frustrations with the boiler. But we give you thanks, God, that uh, this, this will uh, be attended to. And we give you thanks that we uh, still feel warm and certainly the warmth of your spirit moving among us. We lift up to you, God, those who are ill, who have been facing challenges and obstacles. We lift up Charlie Combs, who is in the hospital uh, recovering from pneumonia, and we ask God that you would surround him with your love and strength and bring healing to him. Oh God, we rejoice that Dawn's family is safe, her sister in the nursing home, and nieces and nephews, the relief at being able to know where they are and that they have uh, weathered the storm. But God, we pray for them and all that they have lost, um, homes and, and properties and, and possessions. God, we cannot imagine and we ask for you to be with them and, and all who have suffered so much from the hurricane. Bring bring hope in the midst of the long process of recovery and rebuilding. Oh God, we, we lift up Jack to you and we give thanks uh, for good friends who are, are uh, concerned about his welfare, that are uh, thinking of him and wanting him to be well and willing to uh, make a call to, to check up on him. 
uh, even if it, it wasn't needed, what a comfort to know uh, how loved and cared for we are. And we think with, with him about the uh, fallen firefighters memorial today and particularly uh, 50 firefighters whose lives were lost uh, in New York State this year for the um, willingness to serve and to dedicate and uh, to be so self-sacrificing. Uh, God, we give you thanks for uh, firefighters and for this um, special, special memorial this day. And uh, thanks to, as we think of the, the special um, brick for Phil Politano and the dedication that took place, uh, and that we'll be able to be a part of that through sharing in some of the, the pictures that Anne has. Oh God, we lift up to you Diane's niece, Stephanie, uh, expecting her first baby as she is struggling with some blood pressure issues. We ask God that you would uh, be with her and be with the, the child she carries and that you would bring her safely through this season of pregnancy. God, we give you thanks for the gift of music that uh, you bless us with as a way that we draw close to you in worship. We give you thanks for Jane's presence here today and the gifts that she shares with us, uh, even as we anticipate the, the choir coming together and, and sharing with us as well. Oh God, our lives are so full. You have poured out so many blessings for us that we cannot even keep count and we know that even when we struggle, and we do struggle sometimes, God, your presence with us is unwavering. Help us to remember that, that you want to be found by us when we seek you. And so help us ever to search for you. Remind us that your, your dreams for us is a future with hope. And so let us trust in that hope, in that vision you have for us. Oh God, together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, I invite you to stand as you are able as we join in our closing hymn. It's number 428, For the Healing of the Nations.
friends, let us attend to the welfare of the city, of the community, of the nation, of the world, of the places where we live, where God has planted us. For in its welfare, in their welfare, in their shalom, we find our shalom. It's like loving our neighbor as ourself. Friends, let us go forth in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. Thank you.